support um, uh, during that time. So anyway, that was a general area. Um, uh, Bindin province, uh, as you see right here, was the sort of provincial area uh, uh, during that time. Uh, and and uh, again, that was sort of our support area uh, for uh, combat engineers, infantry, armor, artillery, or any of our our troops. Oh, and by the way, the uh, the um, uh, Korean uh, Tiger Division was also stationed in that area. And and although we were not we in our uh, battalion compound were not necessarily supposed to support them with material. The protocol was for them to drive right past us <coughs> down the highway and go to Quignon to get material. But once they knew we were there, then they stopped by literally every day to get material. And as long as I had it in my inventory and, and they needed it, then as far as I was concerned, they could have it. So what were the elements of the battalion? Uh, we had five companies, 98th Light Equipment Maintenance Company, uh, our company, the 160th, again, the 618th Heavy Equipment Maintenance Company, the 554th Light Equipment Maintenance Company, and the 88th, 65th Engineer Detachment. Each of those units had a specific area and level of expertise that they then used to repair equipment. We had every level of, of repair. We repaired everything from a 45 pistol to an M48 tank. Uh, track vehicles, wheeled, wheeled vehicles, small arms, everything you could think of we repaired. And we had every piece of material that you could imagine in inside storage, outside storage, uh, you name it. We had literally a multi-million dollar uh, inventory. So some of these pictures are yeah, a little bit fuzzy, but uh, and I wish I had better pictures of the entire compound, but but unfortunately I don't. Um, from this from this upper level, uh, the highway Highway 19 is right here, going going north, and up here somewhere is the branch that goes goes off to um, um, highway, the, the highway up to Mangyang Pass. Right down here is, is the, is the, is two, two places. Right here, this building right here is the, uh, is my, my office office where I would work pretty much out of every day. Uh, the next slide shows a little bit better, a little bit better picture. And then this right here with the slanted roof is a semi-trailer, air-conditioned by the way, uh, where our computer was located. And I'll show you another picture of that in a minute. All right, here's, so here's a better picture. So here's one of our warehouses right here. Uh, here's that same building where, where my, call it tech supply office was. And then here's the, the, the semi-trailer now across the road, right over here, uh, two things are going on here. Oh, two other, two other units. In this, in this area right here, although you can't see a whole lot of it except, except for uh, a lot of equipment that that has a lot of uh, draped uh, 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 oh, connex boxes. This this unit here was the 504th Military police battalion. And then up here, uh, where you see these barracks buildings, and also you see the, the front fascia here of this, uh, of this combat engineer unit. I don't remember what the, what the unit number designation was, but it was a combat engineer battalion uh, that was also stationed over on this side of the road. All right, so another picture, uh, closer picture. Now, if you see this five-ton truck here and this quad 50, on, uh, quad 50 on the back, this was one of the trucks from the 504th Military Police Battalion. Now, it's not actually guarding this vehicle right here, <laughs> okay? But, but this was one of many trucks like it that 
that were built specifically for road security, for convoys going up the highway and then up to Mangyang Pass. And the, the, it was just phenomenal to see trucks like this and modified like this. Uh, there were several trucks like this with quad 50s on the back or five-ton trucks with armored plate all the way around it and then 50 cals on each side and M60s on the front. And they were very, very heavily armored. And, and you'd see them driving up and down the road all the time. And then, and then convoys of different trucks, either, uh, either gasoline or oil trucks or trucks uh, loaded with material supplies of some kind or another. So uh, that, was, that was pretty typical, um, maybe not on a daily basis, but, but uh, definitely on a, on a periodic basis. Uh, again, going, going up and down the road. You have to keep this slide down because I'm not getting a good, no, not getting a good picture. Oh, okay. Can we turn it on? Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. All right. So, so we, we used different tools, again, a lot of uh, both manual uh, 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 tools and then, and then the computer for managing the inventory, managing the, uh, the, the warehouse information uh, for keeping track uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the inventory and managing what we distributed to the, to the repair centers. Oh, now, now, of course, of course you needed a, a very hardworking supervisor uh, to, to manage, to manage uh, the, the resources and, and to manage the, uh, the work going on in the office. So there you go. Uh, but then you also needed a hardworking staff. Um, and, then, and then, by the way, I still have a lot of the Polaroid pictures uh, that, I, that I took back then. So left to right, okay? Ken Rollins, he was from Kansas. And then in the back, Bob Gerhardt, he was from Pennsylvania. And then the tall guy in the back was Jay Moreland, he was from North Dakota. And then uh, Joe Cardella, he was from Pennsylvania. And of course, there's the smart guy in the middle. And then, and then there was another guy, Danny Causey. Uh, he wasn't in the picture, but he was from Missouri. They're just a bunch of great guys. That was a lot of fun. So that picture there is we it was inside inside the uh, uh, our so-called tech supply office, and we did a lot of work in there uh, as well as on the computer. And the, by the way, that wasn't everybody uh, because there were another there was another group of guys, two or three guys that were actually the uh, the computer technicians uh, that were there to keep the computer running. Um, and uh, and we all we all kind of took our turns doing everything that we needed to do. And then there was either, either and there was also another group of of warehouse staff uh, that that worked in the warehouse to keep the 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 inventory counts um, uh, uh, up up and and correct from from day to day. Oh, that another another great picture. Uh, now that is inside the trailer where the computer was. This is an NCR 500 computer. And, and this guy right here, um, Alfred E. Newman, uh, needed, needed, we needed all of his help and to, to keep the computer going. So this, what you might, you could call it a computer, you could call it a glorified um, uh, bookkeeping machine, whatever you wanted to call it, but, but it actually helped us a lot. Uh, this, this big box right here, was pretty big. That was the whole CPU, by the way. Okay. Now, now, probably, probably the the uh, the chip in my in my cell phone was probably as powerful as this thing was back then. Uh, and and just real quickly, we had and and some of you guys probably remember uh, a probably a three by eight, roughly. IBM punch card was our inventory record card. So that was the inventory card that would have been in every bin, nuts, bolts, screws, okay, uh, 
uh, on on a pallet of tires, uh, 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 on a on a on a uh, big box that had a tank engine on it in it. Uh, that was our inventory card, and and in over here was another table that had the card reader on it. Okay, so every day at the end of the day, the guys from the warehouse would bring a stack of inventory cards or those IBM punch cards that we would then read okay in the card reader and then the person that was assigned to that that day's worth of of accounting or auditing would read those record cards and then and then there were um, I would say from what I remember they were probably a little bit larger than this ledger cards that were the data cards that would fit into this keyboard, this typewriter carriage here, had a magnetic strip on one side, and then, then the typewriter part would print on the front the, the record, that daily record of the inventory for that item from the, from the data card, and then the magnetic strip then would electronically record that data entry that would then be recorded electronically in the CPU. So that was very briefly the transaction record for that each of those items per day, every day. And then, not surprisingly, we would then be able to do quarterly audits for, and that's, we would also do that. We would do inventory audits quarterly or I forget exactly how often, but let's say we did them quarterly for our inventory. So how, how, how interesting is that? It was like, it was like really real computer stuff, you know, in Vietnam during the war. Okay, so there you go. So I thought that was pretty cool. And, and what was really cool for me was I was already a high tech guy anyway. So I was eating that stuff up. Oh, so where we lived, okay. I'm always, gosh, I'm always in these pictures. Okay, so, so we had, so, so it's not like, so it was kind of a quandary to me because here I was in the middle of the war, okay. Okay, we were, you know, we were there during the Tet Offensive, but it was like, it was like, it was like a job for me, okay. And I was going to my job every day. Okay, now we had a little bit of action every now and then, but, but, but nevertheless, uh, uh, we, we, we had, and, and, I, and I almost felt guilty after the fact because, because I, I, again, because I had to deal with being there but not being in a combat unit, and, but, but again, it was like, okay, somebody's got to do this, so it might as well be me. Okay, so, so there you go. So here we are in single story and two story barracks. All right, so here's some of our two story barracks and then and then sandbag bunkers out, out in front just in case. And then I guess I could have made up an interesting story about that smoke, but you know, what the hell. All right, so more sandbag bunkers out in front. All right, so now, pet offensive. Um, and then and then in the handout I, I put a little blurb about the the Tet Offensive and and what happened and and during that I won't get into too much about about what happened during Tet but but it was it was a extremely well orchestrated well planned um, uh, offensive on the part of the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong where in this map uh, the the map shows I mean, you can read about what happened, and you can read the 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 blurb that I got from the internet. But but until you see a map like this, um, the it doesn't really hit home um, how how oops how well uh, and how well coordinated the 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 offensive was when you really consider that all of these cities, all of these towns, all of these provincial capitals were all hit at the same time by the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong. 
Okay, and then when you consider that 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 Saigon, that we we literally almost lost the embassy, Tonsonut Air Force Base, that we came this literally this close to being overrun uh, in some of those in some of those cities, uh, and we were extremely lucky uh, that 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 didn't happen. Uh, and uh, so the good news the good news was that. For just a matter of a couple of days, the, the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong did, did uh, uh, overwhelm the, the U.S. and Allied troops in those, and the South Vietnamese troops in those areas. But once, once we got our shit together uh, and, and, and launched our appropriate counteroffensives in those areas, then then we we had the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong on the run. Uh, I think there were I think the the uh, reports were that there were about 80,000 uh, North Vietnamese and Viet Cong killed uh, in the counteroffensives, uh, and then and then we were pretty much on the way to to I call it victory, what have you. Here's the unfortunate part. The unfortunate part was that. At home, the Tet Offensive got negative press, and where we may have won a military victory with the counteroffensive, we did not gain a political or 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 a public relations victory at home, and therefore. By mid to end of 1968, the war was pretty much lost at home. We may have thought militarily we were okay and won a victory, but we did not. And in February, late February, uh, a, a journalist by the name of Walter Cronkite pretty much sealed uh, our, our, our doom uh, by making a radio or TV announcement uh, that said just that, 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 we, that we did not win a military victory. Uh, and uh, I, I actually was going to put that in, the, in my handout, but I actually didn't have room. But you can, you can Google it and you can look, read it and all that. But, but he, he was probably most responsible as anyone, military, politician, or otherwise, uh, to, to tell the American public uh, that that we were on our way to a stalemate, uh, that we the stalemate was his word, uh, that we were not going anywhere uh, militarily, uh, and uh, and then unfortunately that that just emboldened the protesters, uh, and uh, and and that was pretty much the turning point uh, in the war in Vietnam at that point. So downtown Quy Nhon before the Tet Offensive. Nice, peaceful little little seaport town. These are all my pictures, by the way. And I, and I didn't have very many of them, but a couple of them. Uh, and, then, and then I was in the following rickshaw there. Um, and this is, a, this is a roadway going out of town uh, on the way to the beach. And then I think that, that was the, oh, and then one more. This is a movie theater. Uh, actually, a very nice looking building. Uh, at that time, then, then uh, this is actually a wire service photo uh, that I found on the internet not too long ago. Uh, this is a radio station building uh, that uh, that was downtown, and the story behind this is that right at the outset of the Tet Offensive, um, uh, either on the uh, 31st of January or the next day morning, February 1st that, uh, that uh, the North Vietnamese uh, got uh, some hostages uh, in the building and uh, the uh, South Korean uh, uh, elements of the South Korean uh, Tiger Division. Um, I don't know if they actually saved the hostages, but they blew the hell out of the building, uh, which was the way the story goes. Okay, nobody knows if the hostages were actually saved. But, but that's that what was left of the building after the South Koreans got through with it. Um, a few months later, a few months later, after 
things kind of calmed down and we were actually allowed back in the city, you know, like for weekend leaves and passes and so on. Uh, there I am in front of the building. Uh, and actually, I don't know if you can see him, but there's a little kid uh, right here uh, standing in front of that post. Now, by the way, I will tell you that I wasn't the only one that, that had this souvenir picture uh, taken of them in front of that building. Because, because and, and, there, and of course, there were other remnants of uh, post-Tet uh, in Quinyan. Uh, but uh, that building and that picture became very popular uh, with a lot of people uh, after, after Tet. Um, I, uh, I, I went into town every once in a while, but it, but it wasn't something that I, uh, that I did very often. Uh, okay, so here, here are some of those statistics that I was telling you about. Uh, all of this information, by the way, came from uh, uh, the uh, National Archives uh, website. Uh, so so, so th it th through the entire war, uh, 58,220 uh, U.S. soldiers killed during the war. Uh, and, then, and then the one chart that I had in the handout was, was troop strength. So, so in, the, in, in almost the same years, these were the, these were the uh, troops killed uh, during those years. Uh, and it's kind of an interesting bell curve uh, starting in 1965, although the numbers were a lot smaller in the previous years. But uh, for almost 2,000 starting in 65 and then ramping up uh, 66, 67, and then 68, almost 17,000, just in 68. Uh, and, then it, and then it scaled back down, 69, 70, 71. Um, soldier deaths by state. So I just picked, I, every state was listed, but I just picked California because that was the most, 5,500. Vermont was the least, 100. And then I also threw in Colorado from our state, 623. By the way, I have the numbers if anybody cares uh, about their own state. Uh, soldier deaths by military branch, Army, 38,000. Marines, 14,000. Air Force, 2,500. Navy, 2,500. And the Coast Guard, seven. Yeah, a lot of people didn't know the Coast Guard was over there. The Coast Guard was there. In fact, I have a cousin uh, uh, who's two years older than I am. He's still alive, bless his heart. Uh, he was in the Coast Guard. Uh, he was, in fact, he was there for uh, part of two years. He did two tours. Uh, he was on a destroyer. Uh, off the coast. Uh, soldier deaths by race, ethnicity, uh, white Caucasian, almost 50,000 out of that 58,000. Uh, African American, 7,000. Hispanic, 349. Uh, Native Hawaiian, and that Native Hawaiian also is all of the, all of the islands in the, in the chain, 229. Uh, American Indian, 226. Uh, th this is interesting because I just, I just literally just copied the, the way that the, uh, uh, the, the, the race thing was, was presented in the, in the uh, thing. Non-Hispanic, more than one race. Now, I have an issue, I don't know about any of you guys, but when you fill out a, an employment form or any other state form, and you have these, these choices of ethnicity, there's never one for me, but that would be mine. Okay, I am non-Hispanic, but more than one race, because I'm Italian and Mexican, so I don't consider myself Caucasian, but I'm non-Hispanic because I don't have a Hispanic surname, but I'm non-Hispanic, but I'm more than one race. So there you go. All right, all right. So Asian 139. All right. Yeah, yeah. Or other. Oh, by the way, I got to throw this in. Facebook, Facebook has a page for gender, and you have 58 choices. I'm not kidding you. Okay, I'm not kidding you. So in case you're interested, go to Facebook. Okay. 
You have 58 choices for gender on Facebook. Okay, anyway, soldier deaths by, by rank, okay, enlisted men, E1 to E9, 48,000. Officers, two, two officer choices here. Uh, uh, regular officers, 01 to 08, 6,000. Warrant officers, because warrant officers were pilots, okay, 1,200. Uh, and, then, and then undefined, so I don't know if they just, you know, couldn't identify, but that total, that total is the 58,000. I love this picture. Uh, this, is a, this is a very famous uh, picture uh, called Reflections and Reflexes, uh, and the photographer uh, is a gentleman called Lee Tater, and, and so the, 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 he created this picture from from the uh, from the uh, memorial wall, and I'm not sure how he did this, but but if you if you were to Google this this by title or by by uh, by photographer name, uh, this will come up on the on the uh, internet uh, every time, and I I just love this picture and it's a testament. To uh, everybody that served. <sighs> anyway, all right. So, so that's that's that part of of uh, my my personal and military life. Any questions before I go to my my career in the industry? All right. So I'll, I'll try to make this this quick, but but I think this is interesting. So 45 years uh, in the electronics industry. So 1965 to 2014 when I retired in January. So, so those years minus three years when I was in the Army. Uh, I, the segments I was in, consumer, commercial, and aerospace. I, I was with leading edge companies through uh, all those years uh, in, in, uh, involved in leading edge technologies. Uh, like I said, uh, before areas of expertise included manufacturing, design engineering, product marketing, uh, and again logistics support, uh, production support, and product uh, production engineering. So, if you go back to uh, the early years, okay, uh, the early years included uh, being involved in companies, uh, and I said this before. That, that were involved in, in aerospace uh, and involved with, with products or things that I actually were, were involved with uh, that had to do with aerospace um, and, and, uh, and things like, uh, things like um, uh, the early, the early um, uh, Apollo missions uh, and and uh, and like I said, some of the some of the devices or products I worked on uh, might have or did wind up in uh, the Apollo uh, spacecrafts, uh, and uh, uh, it, it was it was uh, it was certainly a fun thing to be involved in at the time. Um, now, the other thing that was fun was not just the aerospace stuff, but the consumer stuff. Okay. Um, and and uh, the uh, I, I again I don't know if anybody is familiar with Byte Magazine, but Byte Magazine back in the early 70s was the holy grail of hobby computerists back before there were home computers, back before IBM, back before Apple computer, back when. The only computer that you could own was called a kit computer that you could only buy from people in Silicon Valley or in Santa Clara or in Northern California and by people that, that, were, that were in the hobby computer industry, people like Bill Godbout and George Morrow. Okay. So back in the 70s, I was, I was already working in, in, a, in a company or in companies where I was a printed circuit board designer. I designed 
or did physical layout, if you want to call it that, for boards like this, pictured on this page. Okay. Now, this in this issue, December of September of 1976, these two boards right here that I designed wound up in this magazine. Okay, and I worked for Bill Godbout and George Morrow. These two guys were legends in their time in the hobby computer industry in the 70s. Okay, back in back during this time, there were two kids by the name of Gil, Bill Gates and Bill and and Steve Jobs that were just kids piddling around in in their garages thinking about what they might want to do when they grew up. Okay? Okay. Just to give you a point of reference. Okay? So, so I was working for a, a power supply company in Santa Monica back then, and I was working with some engineers who knew uh, 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 Bill Godbout and George Morrow, and, and this engineer came up to me one day and said, Ed, would you like to do some contract design for some friends of mine in Northern California? I said, sure, I got nothing better to do. I'll make some money at the same time. And so what they were doing is they were working on, oh, look, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, what's his name? Um, what's his name? Um, it'll come to me, War Games. Um, Matthew Broderick and Ali Sheedy. But the picture, but the picture is what a kit computer looked like in 1976. This, this MSI, you can see the name right here, this MSI computer. Well, the computer is this thing right here. What's down here is the so-called disk drive unit. Well, the disk drive unit was a floppy disk that was that was 12 inches, 12 inches in diameter. Any of you guys see the movie War Games? Okay, all right. It's one of my favorite all-time movies, okay? So during, during the movie, Matthew Broderick has to hold this 12-inch floppy disk in two hands. You know, he pushes the button, this thing ejects, okay? And he puts the 12-inch floppy disk in the disk drive and then closes the door, okay? And that was the method of recording data on, on the floppy disk to either, either record data or put data into the computer, which is this thing right here, okay? That, that's the computer. And of course, here's the monitor and the keyboard, okay? That was a computer in 1976. Home computers, IBM computers, Apple computers, we're still 10 years away, 10 years, mid-1980s, okay? All right, this is a point of reference, all right? All right, so, so Bill Godbot and George Morrow asked me to, do, to de design these boards that would then go in their own version, their own version of, of one of these that they were then gonna sell to the public. So that's what I was doing in 76. And then, of course, there's the Whopper computer that, that was depicted in the movie. And, of course, the movie was sort of, sort of f in fun poking at, at Matthew Broderick as a kid hacking into a Defense Department computer back then. The movie came out in 1983. Okay, so the other thing that I did in 1979 is a is I I was asked by a friend of mine to come to Mattel Electronics, or Mattel, which was just Barbie dolls and roller skates in 1979, and join the beginning of the electronics division at Mattel. I got four or five friends of mine, contract designers, and we d formed a design group that that created the first prototype of the Mattel in television. Uh, home computer and video game system that was competing with Atari 2600 back then, 1980. We went to the CES show in Las Vegas with that prototype system 
and years later, Mattel produced millions of this Intellivision system. So that's what I did in 1979. 50th anniversary of Ball Aerospace. Okay, that's not the best picture, but but 2006, 700 of us Ball employees stood out in the parking lot of at the corner of Arapahoe and and, uh, and Commerce Street and formed this Ball Aerospace logo. Okay, and I'm. And I'm standing, I think, <laughs> I'm standing like right there somewhere. Okay. Okay. And then, and then, we had one of our imaging satellites fly over and take our picture. Okay. <coughs> Wasn't that cool? All right. And that was and that was one of these. Uh, we at Ball we we designed and developed four generations of of Worldview satellites for Digital Globe, and that's one of them. Uh, and then and then the the other things that I got my hands on besides Worldview One, Worldview Two, and Worldview Three was Deep Impact. Uh, that was that was the one that chased the comet back in 2005, and uh, that was about 80 million miles out. And and the impactor part of the satellite caught up with the comet and on July 4th, 2005. That was fun. And then Kepler, uh, Kepler was was another one. Uh, the high-rise camera. This one that was part of the Lockheed Martin Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And what was cool about the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter was that <coughs> the, the orbiter currently is still orbiting Mars today. Uh, I think it launched back in 05. But the cool part of what the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and the high-rise camera as part of that does, when the Curiosity rover, which is the current rover that's on the surface of Mars, when the rover first deployed to land on Mars, the, the MRO flew over the rover as it was descending to land on Mars, and the high-rise camera snapped this picture of the, of the rover as it was parachuting to the surface of Mars, and that's the picture right there. It's zoomed in right here, but that's the picture of the rover descending as it's parachuting to the surface of Mars. So the timing of that picture was just awesome. This was even better. Okay, that's a picture of what the, ro the current Curiosity rover looks like. But this picture that the high-rise camera took, here's the rover on the surface of Mars, and here's some tire tracks of the rover as it's, as it's been going on the surface. And then that's where the rover was at that point when it stopped when the, when the high-rise camera took that picture. So there you go, my career in the electronics industry.